chapter 6, David Thoman came and he preached out of Romans chapter 1 and he talked about evangelism. I feel that if we really align and really get the heart of this, we're going to revisit this one passage that we preached, maybe it was uh, June of 2018. We're going to revisit it. We're going to drive the nail home. But if we can really get this, I, I believe that we're able, because look, if you think about our vision statement, it is to be a life-giving community for all ages and all races where Jesus is the main attraction. And if you think about the vision statement, it comes in three parts. Community, to be a life-giving community for all ages, all races, where Jesus is the main attraction. So the first piece is all about community. How do we do community well so that we have the trellis that will support the vine of God's growth? I feel like when God really moves, a lot of our ministry will be so easy. The Holy Spirit will touch people's hearts. Have you ever been in a situation where you, you, you like spoke to somebody about the gospel and you have just messed it up? You have confused it. You have just it, you made it convoluted. It's like what in the world? But yet the Spirit is moving on this person's life and they want it so bad. What do I got to do? Just tell me. And they give their life to, to, to the Lord right then and there. And you know it wasn't you. It wasn't me. Because, man, I really messed that up. But yet it was all God. And I feel when God's spirit falls, our trellis will be so full of vine. Because what God is doing, not because what we are doing. But I think that trellis is really the community. The community, we're getting the, we're getting the trellis ready. It needs to be, it can't be fractured. It needs to be whole. So it can support the vine to worship Almighty God. He is the main attraction. Nobody else is, is the attraction. No other program we have. It's Jesus Christ is the attraction. So today we're going to be talking about the concept of unity out of Ephesians 4. And if you think about these letters of Paul. Paul was an apostle. He went around and started churches. And then he left pastors to take care of those churches. And then he wrote these letters of instruction to the church. And in these letters, he tells the churches, okay, you need to do this and do this and do this and do this. These letters, these are letters of instruction. Do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. But before he ever gets to what he wants us to do, Paul, he makes sure we understand what Jesus has already done. Because what we do means nothing outside of the light of what he has already accomplished. So why don't you throw up that next slide. Oh, the do and the done. Your do is based upon his done. God or anybody else can't expect you in your sinful and broken condition to do anything. Jesus says, I'm the vine, you are the branches, whoever abides in me and I in him. He it is, she it is that bears much fruit for apart from me you can do nothing. So any time you read a do, do this or do that in the Bible, it is always, you can always see it connected with what Jesus or what God has already done for you. And so your do is based on his done. And so I want to show you this a little bit today. If you go back to that in Christ slide. So we need to know that we're not purchasing our salvation that our salvation is already purchased for you. And based upon your belief on the work of Jesus Christ, you have become a new creation. Not because of what you've done, not what you have performed, not how well you've achieved. Oh, how are you going get to get to heaven someday? Well, I'm a pretty good person. No, it's not based on that. Even if you were a, a, 
the best person who has ever lived. The Bible says your works are, your good works are as filthy rags compared to the righteous standard that he has set. Only Jesus has accomplished sufficient enough work for your salvation. And so he's purchased it. So you don't go on your own merits. You go on the merits of Christ. He bought your ticket. And you will never buy your ticket into heaven. If you believe that. If you believe the work of Jesus Christ. The done finished work of Christ. You are a new creation. Based on the merits of Christ. And so he goes into, in the book of Ephesians, this, this letter, he goes into a long dialogue on all the completed works of Christ on your behalf. We talked a, lot, a little bit about this a couple years ago, but let me throw up this list here. Look, here, here, here. Here's a summary of what he has accomplished for you. This is Jesus. So Jesus has done this. He has redeemed you. He has forgiven you. He has saved you by grace. He's sealed you by his spirit. He has filled you with power. He has seated you with Christ. You are a citizen of, of heaven. You are a member of his family. You are rooted in love and you are inhabited by God. If you believe in the work, you are in Christ and these are your realities do you believe do you believe this is your reality soak in this reality soak in this truth this is your truth this is your identity and this is a done deal According to Ephesians chapters 1, 2, and 3, it's an incredible document. Chapters 1, 2, and 3, this is a done deal. Do you believe it? Do you believe Christ? Then you ought to believe this about yourself. This is your truth. This is your reality. And it's not based upon how well you perform, how much you do. What you achieve, it's based on what he has done for you. And if you believe it, there it is. It's your reality. And listen, what you do, what you do in life, what you do for the Lord, what you do in ministry, what you do for others ought to be motivated by this. Draw up on this. And it's not the other way around. <clears throat> so soak, 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 soak in this reality. This isn't done because of what you do. This is done because of what Jesus has done. And you do motivated out of the reality of what he's done. So uh, it's interesting. In the first part of this letter, not once does Paul tell us to do one thing. All he's telling us is all these things, what's already done. Done, 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 done. Three chapters of done. This is what's been done. And the very first thing he tells us to do is found in chapter 4, verse 1. It's a six-chapter letter. Of course, there wasn't chapters in the original letters. This is how we divide it out. But it falls out really nicely because the first three chapters is what he's done. The next three chapters starting with chapter 4, verse 1, is what he's asking you to do in light of what he's already done. And the first thing, the first thing he asks us to do is what we're going to read today. Chapter 4, verses 1, and I'm going to read through verse 6. We're going to actually just look at verses 1 through 3, but I'm going to read through verse 6. So let's read it together. Chapter 4, Ephesians 4, verse 1. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. 
with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called with a call to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Do you hear that? Unity. This is the predominant thing on God's mind after he's lavishly given you all things. In the light of all these duns, this is what I want you to do. He says, I want you to walk in a manner worthy of the duns of Christ. This is who you are now. Act like it. You've been washed. You've been redeemed. You are a Christian. Now walk like a Christian. So in chapters 1 through 3, Paul tells us basically we are worthy. Chapter 4, verse 1, he tells us so walk worthy. Are you worthy because you walk worthy? No. You are worthy. That comes first. He's made you worthy. So therefore, walk worthy. And if you're going to walk worthy, you're going to walk together. That's what this passage is all about. You're going to walk together. Walking worthy is walking together, and that's what we're talking about this morning, unity. Walking together. So walking together is uh, the Spirit's conception of walking worthy, and this is Paul's passion. For the rest of the letter, he just fleshes out what it looks like to walk worthy, what it looks like to walk together in unity. And what puts this in jeopardy? What puts unity in jeopardy? What, what puts walking together in jeopardy? Conflict. And it's inevitable. Right? You, you get people together. You get people together on a team. You get people together on a, in, in, a, in a family, uh, a, a church, a small group, or whatever. Eventually, there will be some points of conflict, right? And, and so, you know, we see this on a national level. We've got a very deeply divided country. Right? You, you just read stuff, and it's just, I mean, these people are very <sighs> divisive on some issues, right? Or you look at marriage, and marriages fall apart because you got irreconcilable differences. Or you got, like, Facebook, you know, people are really just hashing things through, putting issues out there, and slicing and dicing, and whoa, I mean, it gets pretty volatile, or like reality TV. I mean, just that's some of that stuff. It's like people like authenticity, but that's a little bit too much authenticity. I mean, just there's a lot of conflict out there. And it's important that as a church that we don't adopt the spirit of the age. Watching how other people deal with conflicts and things, that's not supposed to be the way of the people of God. So what do you do when you're faced with conflict? Well, there has to be a different way. And it's found here. In this small little passage, verse chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, this should be our ethic. This should be the way we handle conflict. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, if we were to live this, we would walk worthy of the calling with which we have been called, and we would honor what Christ has already accomplished for us. So notice the therefore. Chapter 4, verse 1, he says, I therefore, and therefore is a hugely important word. Therefore means, it, it tells us what all the preceding material was there for. Why did he say chapters 1, 2, and 3? He said all of that to be able to say this right here. He laid all the groundwork, all the duns of Jesus Christ, all the things he's accomplished for you. He said all that 
to say this right here. It's like a funnel. He funnels all the energy of chapters 1, 2, and 3 into this moment right here. He said all, all that to make this here possible. And he says, I urge you as a prisoner of the Lord, walk in a manner worthy in a manner consistent with what I've accomplished. And he goes into it here in verses 2 and 3. Here's how to handle the conflicts of life. With all humility. Gentleness. With patience. Bearing with one another in love. Eager. Hear that? Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So as we go through these two, these two verses, verses 2 and 3, I want to classify this as the three P's of church unity, of family unity, of team unity, any kind of unity you want. You walk here, drawing up on the grace of Jesus Christ to, to be able to do verses 2 and 3, and I call these the three P's. And they're this. Walk pleasantly. Walk patiently. Walk peacefully. This is how you walk together. Walking in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. We are to walk together. And how do you do it? You walk pleasantly. Walk patiently. You walk peacefully. So he basically said, uh, he goes through cha three chapters, chapters 1, 2, and 3, and tells us basically that you are powerful. I mean, you have, got, you have been seated with Christ in heavenly places. Is that not, not just mind-blowing? Just like God has raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at his right hand, he's done the same thing for you. You have been given the same kind of authority to sit in heavenly realms and rule and reign with Christ. And so he did that. And he filled you with power. He filled you with the fullness of who he is. You are powerful. If you were to read chapters 1, 2, and 3, you would see that you are powerful. So, in light of that, he says, be pleasant, be patient, be peaceful. Because that's what godly power looks like. So let's look at this first one here. Walk pleasantly. Beginning with verse 2. Walk pleasantly. It says here, walk with all humility and gentleness. Isn't those pleasant things? I mean, just imagine just, oh, somebody just walking with humility and, and gentleness. I mean, it's just, oh, wow. But what happens when there's conflict? You've got two people trying to assert their will on the other. Right? That's, that's, what all, that's what all conflict is. You're trying to assert your way, your will on somebody else, and they're trying to do that on you, and so it can get pretty ugly. You ever see, you know, you, we see, like, people fight on TV, and it looks so coordinated. It looks so, like, man, I, I would like to do that, you know. Get in there, and you know. But these guys, like the boxers and stuff, they they train to do this. But you see a, a fight in real life, and man, it is nothing but coordinated. It's ugly. I mean, people are flailing and scratching, and it doesn't look good at all. And when people do that verbally, it's just a, it's just a messy. It, it's it's a messy situation. So conflict is a very uh, not very pretty, pleasant thing at all. You got two people trying to assert the will, and you got a major clash. But you got to, right? If you're going to win the fight, you've got to assert your will. But what happens when you conquer? And you realize that you have hurt somebody in the process. What happens when you win the fight and you lose the relationship? 
what happens then? I guess my question is, how good are we at losing an argument? How good are we at losing an argument? Because do you know what? Loving is losing. I can win. I can, I, maybe I'm right. But do I need to prove it? Can't truth just defend itself? Do I need to defend myself? If I'm right, can't I just let it be right and not have to shove it down somebody's throat? Can I just take it on the chin? Maybe I don't convince them that I'm right. Would that be okay? Can we just walk away and lose the argument to win the friend, to win the relationship? Loving is losing. You read about it all throughout the Bible, and if you're going to love with the love of Jesus, he lost for you. If we're going to turn around and love somebody else with the love of Jesus he received, that we received from him, we're going to have to get good at losing. Because that's what loving is. First Peter, think about Jesus when he was hanging on the cross. When he was reviled, he did not return, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he continued to entrust himself to him who judges justly. He was insulted, he was... He was hanging on the cross and people were spitting on him and insulting him. And he is the, the son of all life and the God of all creation. Everything was created through him. And there he hangs on the cross and loving sacrifice for the very people who are spitting in his face. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. I'm going to come off this cross. You guys would be stardust. Get done with you. You ungrateful creatures. He didn't do any of that. He absorbed the loss. And it said here that he entrusted himself. And this is what's going to help us to do this very thing. We have to entrust ourselves to God because he knows how to keep, keep score. I don't need to keep score. I'm just going to entrust my reputation. I'm going to entrust the outcome of the situation, I'm going to entrust the losses that I might incur from this. I'm going to put all that into his hands, just like Jesus did, trusting that he knows how to take good care of me, even though my neighbor doesn't know how, even though my spouse doesn't seem to know how, even though my friends and family don't seem to know how to take care of me, God will. And so therefore, I'm going to trust him, knowing that he will take good care of me. That's what Jesus did. And that's what we're going to have to do to be able to walk together, to even give walking together a chance. We're going to walk pleasantly, with humility, with gentleness. And let me tell you, those are two things I desperately want in my life. Because I'm not always those things. And when I fail, I know, man, I need to go back and I, I need to say, hey, that was, that was wrong of me, and I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Hey, look, anytime you mess up, that's a great place to always look back to. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Because tell you what, that is gentle, and that is patient. That's what we're called to. the argument and knowing how to win the friend. So how do we walk together? We walk pleasantly. Okay, this is not just for this year. This is for the 20s. I want to see the church thrive in this. Oh, it's the community. When people come in, wow, you guys, you act so kind and gentle and patient with your families, with your kids. I love how you just Ah, oh, 
And now I want this to be the earmark of our community as we move into the 20s. Have you walked together? Walk pleasantly. And number two, walk patiently. Look at the, the last part of verse two there. It says to walk with patience. And I love this phrase. Bearing with one another in love. Bearing. Putting up with one another in love. And sometimes people need to be put up with, right? Right? Sometimes we need to be put, I know people are putting up with me. Sometimes I get in a funk. I get in a bad mood. I get crotchety or whatever. I don't know if I'm crotchety. Uh, but I, I, I get, to, what? Come on now. Come on. Sometimes my kids, I know they're having to put up a dad today because he's got a lot to do and he's, he's, he's not in a good mood. We do that with each other. We have to do that with each other. If anything I want in life, it's this, patience, 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 patience. And I, oh, don't ever pray for patience. I pray for it all the time. You, once you pay, pray for patience, God will test the patience. And I don't care. Bring it on. I don't want it. I want to learn. God has been faithful. He has tested me in this area. And by God's grace, he has grown me. He has in this area through many failings. We don't succeed in this stuff. We fail enough until we realize, I can't do it. And then all of a sudden, he takes you to the next level. Just con keep confessing your failures. And that's what takes you to the next level. And sometimes you have to come down to the end of your rope. And then some. Fall flat on your face. And then he takes you to the next level by grace. Because, well, I know I didn't do that. He took me to the next level. So that's a prayer we all should pray on constant basis. Give me patience. Think about the people who, who, who get on your nerves. This talks about bearing with one another. Putting up with one another. Think about the people who get under your skin. Mm, who exasperate you. People who just do things differently than you would who don't even seem to listen to you. Think about those people. And if you know who you are in Christ, you will put up with them. Because they're not coming through for you. And you don't have to have them come through for you. Because Jesus is already coming through for you. Everything that he has done is a, a reservoir of grace and energy and life and love and acceptance and forgiveness. And you're experiencing that, that, that tap is on in your life. It's not a dry faucet. It's flowing into your life. So you don't need this person over here to come through for you. Jesus Christ and his grace is already feeding into your very soul constantly. And so therefore, you can always give out because you are always receiving in. So don't put that pressure on somebody else to come through for you. Put that expectation upon Jesus because he will always come through for you. And that will give you the wherewithal to bear with one another in love. I love the old English way of saying patient. Long suffering. Suffering for a very long time. With somebody that you're trying to love. How do you do it? You go back to chapters 1, 2, and 3. And drink, soak in that reality. You're loved. He, 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 he's given to you all things in Christ. And you, and you meditate and you pray. And you cry out. And you just receive. And therefore you're able to be patient. You're able to suffer a long time. How long are you willing to suffer for somebody else? That's patience. And I think what has helped me tremendously is realizing I'm not called to fix people. We want to fix those around us. We want to 
We want to show them the right way. We want to fix them. In, but, but, but I'm not called to fix. I'm called to love. They're broken. I'm not called to fix them. They are who they are and they may never change. But if I'm pulling up on this resource, I realize I don't need to try to change or fix them. I'm here to love them just as they are. And tell you what, that makes being patient a lot easier. Because I don't have a goal in mind. I don't have some agenda in mind. I'm here just to love you as you are. I accept you right where you're at. And by God's grace, he'll bring transformation into your life. But I don't, I'm not, I don't put that on me. I'm here to love. I'm called to love people. And often, this calls me to suffer. Long suffering. So how do you walk together? You walk pleasantly. You walk patiently. You're, you're willing to lose. You're willing to suffer. And then this third piece, I love this. Walk peacefully. Walk peacefully. Peace, peace in my life is a, is, is a phenomenal concept. I have got to have peace. Peace. And I like to have it in my relationships. Amen? Amen. Look at verse 3. Three. Eager. Eager. So walk, walk in a way that's, a way that's eager, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. peace. I like how the NIV puts this. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. Romans uh, Hebrews 12 says, make every effort to live in peace with everybody. Romans 12 says, if it is possible, as far as it depends upon you, live at peace with everybody. I've had a conflict before with people that to this day still don't like me. Peace is not always possible. But this says here, make every effort. Sometimes you're just going to have to let relationships go with a good conscience of, hey, I have made every effort. Maybe I'm not going to restore and reconcile every relationship that, that's been broken. That's not on me. What's on me is to make every effort as far as it depends upon me, Romans 12 says. Live in peace. So peace is not always possible unfortunately in a broken world but wouldn't it be nice to be able to live with a, with an idea with a no, with a notion with a, with a, with acknowledgement that i have done as much as i could do to see that that conflict was resolved so therefore we 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 humble ourselves we make the first move we take the initiative we write the letter we ask for forgiveness in that conflict in your life that has been, have you ever made an approach and, and, and took some responsibility? In, 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 in some, sometimes there's true victims in life, and I'm not talking about those things when you've been victimized, but, but if you've had a role, anytime there's a conflict in my life, I, I'm saying, okay, there is something I can learn from this. Have I taken responsibility for what I can do? Have I taken the initiative? Have I written a letter? Have I sent the card to resolve the conflict? As much as it depends upon me, I ought to. In the light of all that Christ has done for me, I think Jesus shares a parable of the, this time when, when, when a, a, a manager has, has all these workers and uh, these people like owe him money. And so he takes this guy who had owed him so many talents of silver, which was like, I don't know, years wages. And he just couldn't pay it back. And, and he got down on his hands and knees and begged. And, and the master said, OK, I forgive you the debt. And the guy gets off his knees and he goes over to his his friend. And he puts because because this friend of his owed him money. A lot less, and he puts his hand around his neck. And the guy begs and pleads just like he did to his master. 
He begs and pleads, and he says, no, you have to pay the last penny. Throws him in the jail. How ridiculous would that be? To be, res- to be forgiven of a great debt and then turn around and demand something out of somebody else that you were forgiven of. And Jesus used it to say, if, if you don't forgive your brother, how am I supposed to forgive you? So the thing for us is we need to realize we need to make every effort in light of the great debt that has been forgiven us. And if we realize the debt that has forgiven us, it's an easy thing to come over here and go, oh, get up off the ground. It's okay. I hu- you know, hug and forgive and I release you. It's okay. You owe me something. You hurt me. You, you, you betrayed me. You stabbed me in the back. But I release you. You don't have to, owe, you don't have to pay anything back to me. Because I've done the same thing to my master. He has forgiven me so I can forgive you. He's released me so I can release you. And this is what it looks like to live and walk together. Walk peacefully as far as it depends upon you. Make every effort. Ken Sandy wrote a, a great little book. It's out on the table, on the resource table. It's called The Peacemaker. Uh, and and it's, a, it's a beautiful, beautiful write-up on how to maintain peace in relationships. And it says it like this. Three ways of handling conflict. There's the escape response. When there's a conflict, ah, I don't like conflict. I'm going to get out of here. I don't like this. This makes me feel uncomfortable. The attack response is when I'm focused on you. Oh, you're the problem, so I'm going to attack you. I'm going to show you how you're wrong. So I'm coming after you. And then you got the peacemaking response where I'm focused on us. Is it the escape response, which is all about me? Or is it the attack response, where it's all about you? Or is it the peacemaking response? It's all about us. Us. The Navy, I guess, has this motto that it, it says ship, shipmates, self. See the, see the order? Ship, shipmates, self. So the ship is more important than the shipmates. So the, the, the whole, the group, I'm, I'm thinking about us. It's not, okay, so if I'm talking to my wife, it's, it's us. This is, this is the ship. It's not the shipmates, it's not you, it's not me, it's, it's us. If you're on a team, it's, it's, it's us. If we're, if we're in a church or in a family, it's about us. It's not about me. And it's not all about you. It's, it's the ship. It's the team. And to be able to, to walk in this direction, this, this requires grace. I can't underscore that enough. The grace of Jesus Christ, the undeserved favor God's riches at Christ's expense flowing into your life. If you have grace, you can do this. So this requires grace, and you can't just muscle through it on your own. You can't, you can't do this on your own. In your own resources and strength and wherewithal, you'll snap. You'll get angry. You'll get out of there. You'll, rele- you, you, you'll, you'll seek, seek escape, or you'll seek attack. But to, to, to think peace and think us, this, this requires, hey, we're going to walk together by the grace of Jesus Christ. So we need the realities of chapters 1 through 3, and we need our minds renewed according to chapters 1 and 3. So this requires grace, and this produces testimony. Testimony. Jesus said this. He says, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. To an outside world looking in, to seeing a community walk by these principles, to truly leave, live these out, to actually approach each other and say, hey, I'm sorry, was there something? Did I do something? 
I am so sorry. And to listen with grace. Not to attack, not to defend, but to receive. Not to fix, but just to receive. And to say, hey, I, am, I need to grow. Please forgive me. And to see that gentleness played out in relationship, a watching world would say, wow, I want what you guys have. But if they see, you know, just what all the reality TV and all that Facebook jibber-jabber and all that stuff in our relationships, it's, it's not attractive. It looks no different than what they know already. So this requires grace, and this produces testimony. And we treat each other in a way that shows the power of the gospel. Does the gospel work? People will see it in, in our relationships. You bet it works. You bet it works. You bet it works. So how do we walk together? We walk pleasantly, with humility, with gentleness, willing to lose in order to win. We walk patiently. We're willing to suffer in a long way for a long time for people that we care about. And then we're willing to walk peacefully, willing to do whatever it takes by the grace of God. Because the gospel is at work in my life. So grace is the root. And peace is the fruit. Oftentimes in these letters he says grace and peace. And I think that's really alpha and the omega. The, the, the root and the fruit. The, the grace is, is the resource and the peace is the result. We should have a peaceful community, peaceful families, peaceful teams as Christians because we have the, the root of grace feeding into our life. So I'm going to have you, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me. This is something that we all face. This is something that we all go through. It's conflict. How do we deal with it? How do we respond? Sometimes we respond poorly. Sometimes we respond in a way that, that shows the actual power of the gospel at work in our life. I might ask you to ask yourself, how am I doing with the relationships God has placed in my life? Mando, have you? Come on up here. And I'm going to read this right out of Psalm 139. And I want you to, to be before the Lord, ask the Lord to search your heart. Is there any relationship that you need to mend? Any friendship that you need to restore? Psalm 139 says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. The New Testament says we love because he first loved us. So I'm going to give you a couple minutes to receive the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Is there a comment that you made that may have put somebody off? Do you need to check in on somebody regarding a situation that has been passed? Do you need to move forward with the freedom to know that, hey, I've done everything I could? Answer his call. Take a minute or two. Make a decision to to write that card if you need to place that call because of the grace of Jesus Christ you're able to do it you're able to lose because he has lost for you and guess what the fruit we powerful grace is the root peace is the fruit spend a minute with him and then we'll stand to our feet with one last song of praise